So say there's a stick person standing here, and this stick person has just thrown a rock into the air. So here's the rock, and it's thrown into the air. Now, we can ask the question, what is the path of this rock? We know it'll go up and it'll come back down. And we can use a graph to sort of think about the different things that can happen. So on this graph, our horizontal axis will be time and our vertical axis will be the height, the height of the rock. So at a certain time, we'll call it T1. The stick person throws the rock into the air and at time T2, they catch it again. It's come back down and they catch it. So it starts out at some height and it ends at that same height. And, and we know that it will go up and it'll come back down. It'll look like a parabola. If you've studied projectile motion, you'll know that this will look like a parabola. But there are a couple different parabolas that it could follow, right? It could, it could go extra high and it could come back down. Or it could go uh, take this very shallow parabola. Or if we didn't have any intuition about physics at all, we might think that, hey, it can actually take this funny, curvy, bumpy path. Why not? Now one way that we've already looked at that you're probably somewhat familiar with by now is using Newton's second law to figure out the path of a particle or the trajectory. Right, a force equals mass times acceleration. Whoops. Make that arrow green like the letter. So these are vectors. This is a vector equation and we can use it to find the acceleration at each point if we know the force at each point. And using the acceleration at each point, we can find the position at each point in time. But in this video, we're gonna talk about a different way to do that. So we're not using Newton's second law. We're using something different. And the thing that we're going to talk about in this video is called the principle of least action. So least action. Least action. What is action? Well, at each point along this path, along every path, but at each point, the rock has a certain kinetic energy and it has a certain potential energy. So for kinetic energy, I'm going to write T as a function of time. Right, it's changing its velocity with time, so its energy due to its velocity will also change with time. And then its potential energy, which I'm going to use the letter U to represent, is also a function of time, right? It's moving through this gravitational field and it's changing its potential energy. At each point along the path, there's a potential energy and there's a kinetic energy. And if we wanna write it for this particular situation, we would write one half mv squared for the kinetic energy of the rock and then since it's in a uniform gravitational field, we would write for the potential energy, mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. And right, height is a function of time and velocity is a function of time. So these two things, the kinetic energy and the potential energy are also functions of time. So anyway, we were talking about action, right? What is action? Well, action, for any path is the difference at each point of the kinetic energy and potential energy added up for each point. So I should, I should say that again. So we're adding up the difference between kinetic and potential energy here, the difference between kinetic and potential energy here, the difference between kinetic and potential energy here, for each point along this path, we're, we're adding up the difference between potential and kinetic energy. So to do that, we'll write an integral, right? This is something that's continuous, and we're doing a continuous sum, which is just an integral. So I'll write integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, the difference here between the kinetic and potential energy, integrated over time, Right, these are both functions of t. Integrate from the initial time 
to the final time. From T1 to T2, integrating the difference between the potential or between the kinetic energy and the potential energy, that equals the action for the path. Action. Actually, I'll write action. And we use the letter S for action for some reason. I'm not sure why. So each path has a different action, right? So for the action for this pink path is all of these points added up all along this path. The action for this shallow path is all of these points added up, the difference between kinetic and potential energy. And it turns out that the real path that is taken by the particle, or the rock in this case, is the path where the action is the least possible value for all possible paths. So any crazy path we could have, this path has the least value for the action. Now this seems like something that's fairly mysterious and something we're not really used to thinking about, right? The difference between these two energies dictating the path of a particle, right? We're used to thinking about forces, right? In Newton's second law. But there's a somewhat reasonable way we can try to make sense of this as a, as a balancing act between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So if a certain path wants to have a small action, it wants to have a small average kinetic energy. So T should be small on average. And because of this minus sign here, a path that wants a small action should have a large, large average potential energy. So the rock takes a path that's the best compromise between having a small kinetic energy and a large potential energy. So let's think about this path right here, this very shallow path. Since it's not going very high, it doesn't have to go very fast to get to, get to its highest point, right? It doesn't have to go very far. So it actually does a pretty good job of this goal of having a small kinetic energy. But the trade-off of going really low is that it actually it doesn't reach very high, right? It doesn't, it doesn't do a very good job of accomplishing this goal, a large potential energy. So that's not a good compromise. It, it does well in one, but completely throws away the other. And then as the opposite extreme, we can think about a very tall trajectory where it goes very high, right? It goes very high, so it does a good job of having a large potential energy. But to get up that high, it had to go really fast, and then it actually falls down really quickly too. So it, it throws away this small kinetic energy goal. So the real path, this pink path that we've drawn here, is, is the result of this balancing act between having a small kinetic energy and a large potential energy. So it turns out that when we use this principle of least action and we find this path that has the smallest possible value of this, this S or this action, we actually end up getting the same trajectory that we would have gotten if we would have just used Newton's equations. So you might be saying, well, why the heck would we do this this different way? Why in the world do I want to do this integral, this difference of energies? What is the point? Well, the first reason I think is that it's, you know, it's just plain interesting that we can take this very different view, interesting, of, of the requirement that, that nature follows, right? We can think of it this way and we get the same results as if we think of the force. So this looks at the entire path from one end to the other and Newton's, Newton's second law, it actually just talks about what's happening at each point, one point at a time. So really with a very different strategy we can get the same things and that's I mean that's kind of crazy right now the other reason why you might want to know this is that it's actually quite useful for some things useful so these I mean this for anything we're learning in physics I could have written down these two reasons but but this is specifically useful for more complicated cases, more complex cases. So you can imagine that there are some things where you really don't 
there's there's just it's so complicated that thinking about all of the forces keeping track of everything going on in a problem you know maybe you know the a, an example that maybe we'll do is a pendulum on a pendulum right so there's a pendulum swinging and another pendulum and these are both swinging back and forth right both swinging back and forth and you want to know what both of these pendulums are doing as they're connected and wiggling in this funny way that's actually a very hard problem to do with just Newton's laws but it's actually a little bit easier when you think about the whole path that's happening so I'll leave you there for now